there was a moment there where I think the sun went behind a cloud behind you and mm-hmm. you, you were, you appeared on screen. Uh, but um, up until that time, uh, with your wet. vocal, with your vo- vocal fry and your backlit, it's like you know, anonymous State Department official mm-hmm. gives us a rundown on on the Ukraine situation. In terms of introducing me, yeah, let me. But- give a little bit about my background um i okay well why don't i just say that um mm-hmm. this is deep state kuba he's a regular at the this is revolution podcast um he's been my conciliary uh, as i've uh, started sublation media um and uh he, he's got an expertise in the realm of uh foreign policy u.s foreign policy um kuba why don't you tell the audience a little bit more who you are and 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 why they should listen to you uh, about so, what's going on. I was born in the region and the People's Republic of Poland and emigrated as a child refugee to Canada. Mm-hmm. I studied post-socialist politics and economics at Harvard for my undergraduate. I went on to do a stint in Warsaw as an exchange intern for the Atlantic Council, working at the Polish Ministry of Defense and the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I went on to graduate school where I did a PhD in political science at Berkeley, again, working extensively in post-Soviet, post-socialist affairs, as well as security related matters. And after that, I went on to work on Department of Defense projects in the Middle East and in Washington, DC, the, um, including working with um, flag level officers in the Air Force and other branches, um, as well as briefing um, senior staff on um, Russian geopolitical um, priorities and uh, political economy more broadly. Okay. So over at uh, the This is Revolution podcast, you're known as Deep State Cuba, and this is why, because of that. I've earned the name. Yeah, you've earned that name. So, um, listen, I don't feel like I've been doing my due diligence as this uh, conflict is slowly unwound. That I have not been tracking the stages and uh, towards this invasion very well. So I've been just assuming that it was saber rattling and that we were going to avoid this, but um, it's happened now. Uh, so I want to ask you some really basic kind of background questions, um, to try to make sense of this. Um, the first thing that I will ask, I've sent you a list of sample questions, but it's not the first question I sent you, but it's just, what does Russia have to gain from invading and acquiring the Ukraine or Ukraine? One answer to this question, and this is the answer that Vladimir Putin presents is that Ukraine is Russia, that there is cultural continuity, kinship, actual literal kinship because of the level of intermarriage between Russians and Ukrainians. The Ukrainian territories were part of the Soviet Union. Before that, they were part of the Russian Empire. Very, You have to go very far back to detach the territories of modern Ukraine from um, Russian leadership, Russian um, possession, that there's a single shared language. Ukrainian is different than Russian, but most Ukrainians speak Russian. Some of them speak only Russian. And those that do speak Ukrainian can understand Russophones. Many Ukrainians speak a kind of hybrid language because they're close enough. So you interchange a few words and you, you make yourself understood. Hi there. This is Connor, the language czar. So today I'm in Lviv in Western Ukraine with my buddy, uh, Jan van der Raab of Language Boost. Go check out his channel. It's called Language Boost. Hello everyone. Yeah, and okay. you've been uh, here in Lviv for 10 days and yeah. to speak with local people, you don't speak Ukrainian. So you've tried yeah. to converse in Russian. Yeah. So how's that gone for you? That, that, that works very well. Well, that's an interesting experience because when I came to Lviv for the first time, it was 2009, 
and it was extremely hard to speak in, in Russian here. People um, really insisted on using Ukrainian and they didn't uh, give me much of a leeway being a mm. foreigner. So what's happened in Ukraine, if you've uh, paid attention to the international uh, politics and what's been happening here, is there's been a conflict with, with Russia in the last uh, three years since the overthrow of the Yanukovych government uh, during the Euro, mm. as a result of the Euromaidan protest. And what I see kind of paradoxically is that it's actually easier to use Russian yeah. in Lviv than it was before the conflict. Yeah. The uh, Kiev was the first capital of uh, Russian Eastern Slavic state. Um, they share a religious tradition and orthodoxy. And it's a little like the United States trying to take back Texas or California or New England, where from the perspective of the bigger country, this is a regional identity, but it is subsumed in the greater uh, American or Russian um, character. And the greater country is incomplete without this territory. It's part mm -hmm. of the homeland. So there's that cultural historical explanation from a more pragmatic perspective ukraine has a lot of economic value for russia it's the main transit corridor for russian gas uh, entering the eu the donbass region especially is heavily integrated with russian industry so it's part of supply chains that center not on the EU, but on Russia. The Black Sea coast is strategically significant for uh, Russian security. Uh, Crimea was essential because that's where the Black Sea fleet is based. But Odessa is a major port. Um, that's also valuable. And the territory of Ukraine is a corridor for potential um, invasion, potential aggression by uh, Western powers, by other unfriendly forces. Ukraine is a, a vulnerability for Russian society, for Russian econ economics, for um, Russian security, especially. So as important as it is for Russia to gain these territories, the essential security concern is to deny Ukraine to unfriendly powers, in this case, NATO. If NATO were able to entrench and develop military infrastructure on Ukrainian territory, it could base ships in Odessa. It could move manpower and materiel all the way to um, the borders of central Russia. Mm -hmm. um, Moscow is only 300, 400 miles away from the uh, border. Mm -hmm. Together with what already exists in the Baltic states, this means that Moscow and St. Petersburg would be um, accessible for a rapid strike um, by NATO forces. So when there was a unaligned or pro-Russian government in Ukraine, you didn't have any of this pressure, you didn't have any of this buildup. A Ukraine that's nominally independent, but cooperates with Russia, understands Russian security interests, and doesn't invite NATO in as a military partner, doesn't seek NATO membership, is something that Putin could probably live with. It's something that Russia could accommodate and through different kinds of inducements, political, economic, develop a bilateral ties that would be close enough to essentially bring Ukraine back into the Russian orbit, a kind of Canada-US relationship. Mm -hmm. But when Ukraine is under a government that seeking security partnerships with NATO, that is unacceptable. And at that point, you need to act from the Russian perspective, you need to act um, effectively and aggressively to change that status quo 
to something more favorable. So my, my next question is, um, what is the source of the conflict between the West and Russia? Why, why didn't Russia ever join NATO? I mean, at one point that was floated. I think it's been floated many times. Um, I mean, the official reason was that Russia hadn't democratized or upheld human rights sufficiently, but that doesn't seem right to me given that Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, at what, what is the real reason for the conflict between the West and Russia here? What, what, why didn't Russia join NATO sometime after the Soviet Union collapsed? Well, NATO has always been since its inception an anti-Soviet and la- later anti-Russian um, alliance. Mm-hmm. So the prospect of joining NATO for Russians seemed unnatural. Indeed, the preferred Russian outcome following the end of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War would have been that NATO disbands the same way that the Warsaw Pact disbanded. And Mm -hmm. you would have civilian uh, country-to-country relations, maybe with the EU as a bloc, maybe with individual Western countries, but you wouldn't have an armed camp that was organized against you. Mm-hmm. The, um, as the Cold War ended, the countries of Eastern Europe, especially countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Baltic states, their security concerns remained Russia. They had experienced Russian domination um, both through the Soviet Union and in the case of Poland and the Baltic states, Imperial Russia as well. So for them, Russia was a serious existential, historically grounded threat. And NATO membership was a means of addressing that threat, securing against it. So Russian membership was a non-starter once the Eastern European countries came in. The whole point for them was to keep Russia out. The Western powers also didn't really respect or um, or reckon with the potential that Russian security interests would once again be a matter that um, that could move European uh, politics. Instead, they thought that Russia was toothless, harmless, and could be pushed around. When the Soviet Union, uh, when the Eastern Bloc countries began to uh, turn away from communist government, uh, Gorbachev was still a leader of the Soviet Union at the time. The question of what to do with a reunified Germany came up. And the deal that was struck, according to Gorbachev, according to Russian sources, and there's some American evidence to support it, was that a unified Germany would remain within NATO but there'd be no expansion to the rest of the Eastern Bloc. No Poland, no Czechoslovakia, no Hungary. That deal was violated very quickly. And the first batch of Eastern European countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary were admitted to NATO, um, I believe in the 90s. And the... um, so let me deal. ask you about Poland and, and Russia real briefly. Then. Yes. So what was the source? Why why would Poland be particularly concerned about Russian aggression after the Soviet Union had collapsed? What was stopping, you know, uh, the sort of uh, utopian capitalist uh, inter- interactions from occurring? Like just this is our new trading par- partner. These are the new, new, uh, the new version of Russia as a, as a capitalist country with its own, you know, economic interests, but we can work out these, these economic interests, uh, freely, but, you know, between nations rather than worrying about aggression. What was setting up the aggression between Poland and, and Russia? And if, if without the Soviet ideological drive for a world domination or something like that. So, Soviet hegemony over Eastern Europe wasn't 
notional or voluntaristic or peaceful. Mm -hmm. In many Polish sources, you see World War II dated 1939 to 1989, because that is when Soviet troops finally leave Poland and Poland regains meaningful sovereignty. Right. The situation is even more severe for countries like the Baltic states, which had been part of the Soviet Union. And what was treated in many Western countries, especially the, the United States, as an irreversible turning of the page and the beginning of a new era in history, felt to many Eastern European countries like a brief window, some breathing room before the resumption of security competition and a resurgent Russian security threat. So they scrambled to get into NATO as quickly as possible. That was the only assurance they had that a revanchist Russia would be deterred from targeting them. After all, the Poland especially, but Czechoslovakia as well, these countries had been given assurances in 1939 by, um, in the 1930s, by Western powers, by the UK, by France, that they would be, they would not be alone in case of German aggression. And those assurances proved meaningless. Mm. The only factor that determined World War II in their favor, such as it was, uh, that prevented them from being perpetual territories of the Third Reich was American involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the Soviet intervention, but the Soviet intervention was treated as a different kind of occupation, which it was, rather than liberation from the Nazis. You granted Hitler is gone, but now you have Stalin, which for some people was even worse. And the um, Poland used to be bigger and further east. Um, many um, much, a great deal of territory was ceded, not just from Poland, but by Czechoslovakia. Um, and the Baltic states were completely absorbed. And the populations of those territories that were taken, um, especially the Polish population in what is now Western Ukraine, were deported. The lucky ones ended up in a smaller, more Western Poland, but many hundreds of thousands ended up in Kazakhstan, Central Asia, other forms of internal exile within the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So the there was an awareness of the tremendous cost, not just in terms of national sovereignty and international politics, but human cost of um, allowing this opportunity to get out from under the Russian shadow, out of the Russian sphere of influence, to let that pass which is why they so aggressively sought to um, join NATO and the EU. The um, EU, from the Russian perspective, was much less threatening, but NATO was the stronger assurance in terms of security. Mm -hmm. After the so-called uh, Weisgrad group, which is Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, and Hungary are admitted in uh, 1997, um, the new deal that the Americans proposed was, okay, we let these guys in, but we're not going to expand into the former Soviet space. So mm -hmm. this is it. But then they violated that a, a few years later by admitting the Baltic states, which then moves up the borders of NATO to um, uh, within striking distance of St. Petersburg, Russia's second city. And there the perception is that, okay, this is not just looking after the Poles and the Czechs and reassuring them. This is a threatening encirclement. This is an advance uh, towards the, the heart of Russian territory. And in particular, um, the single event that had the greatest damage the, to the dreamed of post-security world where Russia and the United States could just work things out, chat like like gentlemen, um, mm -hmm. was the NATO led um, in NATO led mission uh, into Kosovo, mm -hmm. separating Kosovo from Serbia. The intervention that ended the Yugoslav War, where Russian sympathies were largely with Serbia, was. Um, 
sanctioned by the United Nations and uh, Russia had agreed to it. And the independent states that formed with the dissolution of Yugoslavia had the same principle as the post-Soviet states. If you were a constituent republic, the highest level federal unit, you could become an independent sovereign country. But Kosovo was not that level. Kosovo was an integral part of Serbia. And the Russians considered the allegations of human rights abuses against Albanians to be a fabrication, uh, mm -hmm. you know, an exaggeration, certainly, possibly an outright fabrication. They had little sympathy for a, a Muslim minority on Orthodox Slavic land. They also threatened to veto in the Security Council, which is why the US, um, NATO opted to run this outside of the United Nations, no Security Council resolution, um, and against the strongest objections on the part of Boris Yeltsin and the Russian Federation. The Russians even tried to assert themselves by landing in Kosovo ahead of NATO forces. And they briefly mm -hmm. occupied Pristina airport. When NATO rolls up, they greet them as friends. And it's like, oh, now it's a multinational effort. Let's, let's talk about uh, what the future of Kosovo, what the future of Serbia is. But they were forced to humiliatingly withdraw uh, as quickly as possible. And at that point, it was clear even to Yeltsin who maintained a lot of happy illusions about his relationship with Clinton and the uh, relationship with the West more generally, mm -hmm. it became clear that Russia was not going to be consulted on security matters, even in its own backyard, that the Americans were willing to do whatever they wanted and NATO was their tool. And the places where uh, Russia had dip diplomatic uh, representation, things like the UN Security Council or the Organization for Cooperation and Security in Europe, were meaningless talking shops. The only thing that would deter further encroachment by Western powers would be um, Russian hard power, Russian strength, force. And when Putin replaced Yeltsin, he began a very lengthy process of consolidating the Russian state internally and in rebuilding its security forces uh, to be able to act uh, regionally and globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so what is, um, just to stay with NATO for a moment longer, like what is the functional role of NATO today on a kind of a day by day, by day basis? And sort of add to that, what, um, I mean, I, I think that I, I, I've been kind of considering like what is the Russian motive in terms of its own national maybe imperial project or its own national interest to gain some sort of advantage militarily in order to be a more powerful state in a competitive world say but the, obviously the same is true of the u.s right i mean the, the the u.s's use of nato that you just described while given a humanitarian gloss served its national interests as well. So what 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 role does NATO have on a data by day basis and and for and for US empire? So NATO structurally is designed to prevent strategic competition between Western states by having a club where the Germans, the French, the British, the Americans are all represented and mutually um, secure one another, you eliminate the potentially destructive um, dynamic of a remilitarized Germany or German French or French British or French Italian um, security tensions. That's one major uh, function. Another more prosaic one is to market weapon systems create a market where you could sell F-35s to Denmark or Turkey or other countries so that the United States can recoup 
some of its expenses in producing these weapons. The same goes for weapons produced by uh, European countries. The um, NATO and the Atlantic Council, which is the sort of civilian think tank uh, wing of the um, organization, they also provide an environment where officers and officials and defense analysts from the various NATO countries can work together so that they're familiar with one another. Um, when a crisis happens, they know who to call. They've worked with one another enough. So some of the friction of international cooperation gets dampened. And another important uh, function, uh, another advantage that NATO gives the United States is any mission that the U.S. embarks on, as long as it can flip a few NATO members has the gloss of the international community. This is a global effort. Um, many Americans don't distinguish that much between a UN sanctioned international effort and a NATO uh, mission. Mm -hmm. So it makes American intervention seem uh, less unilateral and imperial by uh, implicating and involving all of these sort of good guy partner countries. Now I guess we're going to get a little closer to um, the present. You know, I've kind of given the background on all of this. Is there something that, that you wanted to bring well, up that I didn't? Just um, yeah. on the NATO side, they also plan for things like a Russian invasion of Ukraine or coordinate on potential expansion, invite new partners in. So they're, while much of the decision-making gets made in Washington, uh, NATO is important for the execution of um, enlargement and uh, the development and vetting of war plans, scenarios uh, for different types of uh, crises or uh, conflicts around the, the around the periphery of Europe. I guess what I want to ask you now is in this present moment, um, like I guess the, the natural thing to ask is what do you think NATO had planned? in the case of a Russian invasion of the Ukraine? And uh, are we seeing that plan in, in action? Or uh, what, do you think that um, NATO and the United States was were caught on their off guard by this action? Or, I mean, I know I was, but I think I was just being opt overly optimistic and whistling in the, in the graveyard or something like that. But So the important thing to know about the U.S., security apparatus and the foreign policy establishment is that it's always 1996. You were optimistic, they were delusional. There's a feeling that the unipolar moment might be under strain, but we're still in the same world, the same post-Cold War, post-Soviet world, where the US is the indispensable nation, it can set the global agenda, and other countries will mold themselves to fit whatever slot they're offered. Mm -hmm. So, and this attitude, this arrogance, frankly, mm -hmm. hasn't been checked by the failure of the NATO intervention in Libya or the catastrophic American occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan or the successful uh, Russian intervention in Syria and in Georgia the mentality is still that there is a US-led rules-based liberal order. We hear that all the time. It's one of the favorite things for um, foreign policy hacks to, to utter. And that it's not only normative that there should be such an order, but that this order exists and that is the appropriate way of the world. So for many members of this, foreign policy and defense establishment, the idea that Russia would tear it to shreds, completely disregard all of the rules and norms that in theory governed international affairs was unthinkable. So they were not serious about what to do with Ukraine once they had it. The Maidan revolution that ushered in a pro-Russian, a pro-American government 
in Ukraine was uh, heavily promoted by, um, uh, I think, Alexandra Newland, the um, a State Department official, um, possibly an intelligence official in Kiev, where she coordinated with various um, opposition figures, including the far right, to orchestrate the Maidan uh, revolution and to usher in a new government, which is not to say that there wasn't legitimate public um, popular participation, but it wasn't this overwhelming grassroots popular rising up against uh, a repressive dictator. Yanukovych was elected. And from the Russian perspective, this was another case of the United States and NATO refusing to play by the rules that they imposed on Russia and mm. other outside uh, countries. You can't dispose, you, you Russians can't dispose of someone like Mikhail Shakashvili, a, a troublesome elected president in one of your neighboring countries. But we, the West, with um, could get rid of whatever elected ruler um, we don't think is pro-Western enough, replace him with a government that's stacked with far-right figures with um, fascist sympathies. And not only that, but we're going to be moralistic about it and treat this as a great liberatory moment. <laughs> so for Putin, that was really the crossing of the Rubicon. We're entering open conflict already. Mm -hmm. And it's only the fact that a very democracy and human rights, best is the best narrative became hegemonic around the Maidan uh, uprising that Westerners don't reckon with that reality, with that Russian perspective, seeing it instead as just another case of heroic democratization against corrupt and uh, abusive uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in that answer, I heard you say that, yeah, you didn't, you think Biden, the Biden administration ultimately, and maybe until a few days ago, did not expect Putin and Russia to invade the, the Ukraine. Is that right? I think that one, they didn't know what to do with Ukraine once they got it. So the governments that um, were established post-Maidan, um, first a transition government, then um, Peter Poroshenko, the a Ukrainian oligarch, and finally uh, uh, Yevlinsky, and uh, not Yevlinsky, mm -hmm. um, uh, Zelensky, mm -hmm. um, the comedian, actor, turned president. None of them have been particularly effective in governing Ukraine. They, it took Vladimir Putin 10 years, conservatively, maybe five years, of very deliberately and uh, methodically crushing the power of Russian oligarchs, reestablishing the um, effectiveness of the Russian state apparatus, subordinating regional governments, and... Um, political institutions in order to create an effective Russian state out of the post-socialist chaos. Mm -hmm. That never happened after Maidan. I mean, it never happened after the end of the Soviet Union in Ukraine either. You went from the Soviet Union to oligarchs, then um, basically a mess and these relatively shallow um, pro-NATO, pro-American governments after uh, 2014. And if NATO had more aggressively tried to increase the competence of Ukrainian government, more aggressively sent arms, more aggressively dealt with the separatists in Donbass or, or tried to retake the Crimea, or alternatively, seriously negotiated with Russia about um, the post-Maidan uh, living arrangement in Ukraine, mm -hmm. Uh, for instance, the Minsk uh, agreement was supposed to bring an end to the separatist violence in uh, eastern Ukraine. 
but the Ukrainians immediately set about uh, disregarding all of the provisions that it imposed on them while loudly uh, trumpeting any violations that uh, the Russians made. So from the Russian perspective, that was another uh, bad faith negotiation, another useless avenue. Mm -hmm. But the, um, and the shift from Obama to Trump to Biden mm -hmm. was a kind of illusory period of calm in that the Trump presidency put, it slowed down any kind of larger American project because of the disorganization, the disorder of the American governing apparatus and the fact that you have the deep state pushing against an elected president, um, his dislike of uh, losing wars or of hard work. And from Putin's perspective, Trump is great because it's not impossible that on some summit or another, get him drunk enough, offer him a couple of hotel towers in St. Petersburg and Moscow, and he might just give you Ukraine. But the whole time, you're also preparing for the military option if that doesn't come to pass. And when Biden is elected to replace Trump, the Russian position deteriorates in that you no longer can hope for an advantageous negotiation against um, buffoonish um, Russophile president. But instead, the blob, NATO, the deep state, the establishment is back in charge of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. But those four years, when Russia was preparing, the United States and NATO were not. And Biden has also proven to be poor at managing large projects or um, handling international negotiations. The, I think that the dismal American um, performance in addressing the COVID crisis may have moved up Putin's timetable by 10 years because if they can't handle COVID, how are they gonna handle Putin? Hmm. And um, the... And I would just point out that the United States response to COVID is not, if you look at it in terms of population, it's not that different from the EU's response to COVID. Which is also terrible. Right. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. And, right. um, you know, if we're handicapping based on COVID response, mm -hmm. um, I look at what China did and I put off any plans that I might have for brinksmanship. Mm. indefinitely i look at japan <laughs> i look at south korea i look at the asian countries and i'm like these these are effective these people will mobilize they'll get things done um they should be respected mm. and i look at western countries they're feckless they're incompetent um there's there's no there there um mm. and not only that but their own people are tearing down um the state apparatus they're busy sabotaging um, the political leadership, however they can, they're tearing at each other's throats. Now is the moment to strike. This is weakness. This is what weakness looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, not only that, but there's a major difference in terms of the importance of Ukraine to the two sides. For Russia, it is an existential and spiritual imperative. Uh, it's fundamentally part of the Russian sense of space and culture, or it's enough of that so that Putin can convincingly play that card with his uh, public. Uh, for Putin, personally, his legacy will be strengthening the Russian state and also reestablishing Russian security with Ukraine being the crowning achievement. Mm -hmm. And for the United States, it's just you know, another feather in your cap. It's just mm -hmm. another um, victory lap, another end zone dance. And it came relatively easily and cheaply. 
it's been such a long time since the US or NATO has undertaken a serious and successful project that I don't think they have the institutional capability or the muscle memory to actually do anything on that scale effectively. So um, they tried to basically bluff, bluff their way in, talk big, give all kinds of assurances, um, use it as a dumping ground for weapons, as a contracting opportunity for their um, defense, um, military industrial complex, uh, mm. corporations and firms, and basically let the Ukrainians figure out all the rest. And anybody with a sense of um, proportionality or um, a willingness to take an accurate and sober look at the capabilities of a Ukrainian state, of the Ukrainian state after 2014, would know that they're not going to figure it out. You're going to need to make um, some tough decisions and you're going to need to be willing to implement some of the changes for Ukraine, give them the roadmap, hold them to it, and do this every day. But that's work. You don't want, mm. don't really want to do it. You just want to make some speeches. You want to feel good about yourself. Um, you don't really need Ukraine. If it falls, then it's unfortunate. But then you get to make other speeches and act all serious and, um, you know, talk about you know President Putin. This is unacceptable. And we have saw this before with the um, 2008 uh, Russian-Georgian war, which mm -hmm. essentially was a dress rehearsal for what's happened in the Ukraine. Uh, two regions within um, Georgia have a majority non-Georgian ethnicity, um, official status recognizing that ethnicity is a federal unit, and are adjacent to Russian territory, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Mm. And since the end of the Cold War, those areas were under local administration. They hadn't declared independence, really, but they also weren't letting the Georgian state, the Georgian central government, run those territories. Mm -hmm. Shakashvili, uh, a Western-educated um, sort of charismatic modernizer, liberal reformer type that everybody loved in the 90s, kind of Tony Blair figure, uh, became president of Georgia, aligned it very closely with the United States, sent troops to Iraq. And it was all part of a bid to join NATO. He recognized that that was the only way that Georgia could enjoy real sovereignty outside of the, the Russian sphere of influence. But one of the prerequisites of NATO membership is having no internal border disputes. So mm -hmm. he decided that he would settle the question of these two ethnic enclaves um, by force. Mm -hmm. Georgian troops enter South Ossetia, and that immediately gives Russia the pretext to intervene as peacekeepers to save the people of South Ossetia, to save the people of Abkhazia. And they roll out the Georgian army within a matter of days. They could have taken Tbilisi. They chose not to um, for very sensible reasons. I'd, I'd say it would be very difficult to manage it, um, manage an occupation of Georgia proper. While Abkhazia and South Ossetia, all of those, all of those inhabitants were given Russian passports, and those um, territories were integrated as satellites of um, the Russian Federation. The so Putin knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, the Russian military has developed a great deal of experience with the conflict in Syria, with things like the war in Georgia, with other interventions and operations close to Russia, the, the taking of Crimea. Um, so they could develop a plan and um, with the advantages that they enjoy, the fact that their supply lines are extremely short, that we're talking about an area that you can drive from the base to the border. Um, you have the same gauge of railroad in Ukraine and Russia, the old Russian uh, standard 
in Europe, it's a different gauge. You have to change trains, but Russian mm -hmm. logistics can operate freely and natively in Ukraine. Not only that, but soldiers going into Ukraine can read all the signs, can talk to people. Um, the country is somewhat of an open book for Russian intelligence because of its cultural, linguistic, um, geographic proximity. Mm -hmm. And NATO could not match that without the, a level of effort and commitment of resources that it has not demonstrated since maybe the uh, Yugoslav interventions in the 90s. Right. And if they did, I mean, the consequences for my, what, what about the Chinese role here? Because it seems to me that if NATO decided to intervene and to stop the taking of Ukraine, that th there might be possibly be an intervention from the Chinese. Am I wrongheaded about this? Is that, would that be outside of the realm of possibility? Yes, it's, it's outside the realm of possibility. Oh, good. Okay. The, Phew, good. Uh, first of all, NATO will not intervene. Well, no, they, but I'm saying if they had, mm -hmm. I was getting the sense that I heard from the Chinese that they were supporting Russia, especially in the realm of the separatist region and taking back that part of Ukraine. So uh, the People's Republic of China has no, no real interest in uh, Ukrainian outcome, whether it's pro-Russian or pro-Western. Okay. Anything that weakens the West is good in the, from a uh, Chinese perspective, but if Russia demonstrates too much capability, that's also not great. Mm. The Chinese have an essential role to play from the Russian perspective in keeping um, trade and investment between the two countries going mm. when a renewed sanctions, sanctions regime right. is going to bite into um, Russian uh, e the Russian economy with the shuttering of Western markets and limitations on um, what can be purchased or the movement of uh, money through the West. So what is stopping the United States and NATO? I mean, you said they haven't had that kind of commitment since the nineties, but mm -hmm. I mean, uh, is it just that we don't have that ability after Afghanistan and Iraq to really marshal the forces? Um, materially in the region, or is it a matter of will? Um, because mm. you know, there's always just there's been a lot of this talk. Oh, this is the beginning of World War Three. This is, and if you think in terms of World War Three, you're thinking, okay, there are going to be other players, and the the first one that came to mind for me was was China. But but that's not. You're saying that that really it wouldn't expand out if NATO decided to intervene to stop them. NATO. NATO is not going to intervene. I know. Um, they're going to let the Ukrainians um, hang just like they let the Georgians hang. Right. I mean, Biden has said as much. Mm -hmm. right. And the and of course they are, because mm -hmm. within region, they don't have the assets to challenge this scale of um, Russian advance. They would if you wanted to intervene and you had to start now, if you wanted to intervene, you should have started planning in 2014. If you're mm -hmm. starting now, then you have to identify which units you can move um, because many American units are already tasked with training, with resupply, with maintenance, or with all of the other obligations of American empire, Korea, Japan, um, the Middle East. So you don't have large uncommitted reserves that you can draw on. You have to figure out who you're going to send. Then you have to get them there. You don't, there's no order with uh, Ukraine. So you're going to have to use um, allied airspace, land logistics, or sea routes. Mm. Turkey is probably just not going to let you move warships through the straits. Um, Turkey has 
made all of the appropriate diplomatic uh, messaging in terms of deploring Russian aggression, but they're unlikely to even impose sanctions, let alone um, allow uh, movement through the straits with uh, an aggressive intent, which would actually give Russia a cautious belly against Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, they're unlikely to even let Americans use Incherlik, uh Air Base to conduct operations against Russia. Um, you have to worry about the Greeks that also have pro-Russian um, sentiments. You have to worry about the Bulgarians, the Romanians, you have to worry about the Italians. Any of these um, minor NATO uh, players is a crucial link in the uh, logistics chain that would deliver your troops to the front. And they don't have to say no either. They can just foot drag. They can just say, I, I'm sorry, all our trains are busy. Oh, you know, uh, you can pretend to be incompetent. Um, you have all kinds of ways of um, putting off your NATO commitment until the resolution has already taken place. Mm. And so that's another area where the United States just doesn't have the ability to uh, deploy against uh, Russian forces in Ukraine. If you, um, not at a scale where it could decide the conflict in Ukraine's favor, if you want it to be suicidal, you could do special forces attacks against uh, Russian naval assets. You could send air sorties um, into Ukraine. Um, you would have to either fly from bases in Poland or overfly Russia or Belarus at great risk um, mm. from uh, bases in the Baltic states. Um, you And there's, a, apart from the possibility that the Russians just shoot everything down or that you failed to make a scratch, but now you're at war with Russia. Mm. The, if you use your um, fourth generation aircraft, well, Russia also has fourth and fifth generation aircraft. They're vulnerable. If you use your fifth generation aircraft, like the F-35 Lightning, which is supposed to be the wonder weapon of the US Air Force, you're revealing its combat capabilities to China. The Chinese will see how it performs against Russian air defenses. They'll see how uh, effectively it flies. If any vulnerabilities come out, Russia will share that information with China. Um, or they'll see it on the news when one of these uh, F-35, you know, $100 million, $300, $500 million um, airframes gets grounded by a lightning storm or there's a bug in the code and the entire squadron can't fly and that will significantly dampen the deterrent effect that uh, american forces have in east asia so it's very disadvantageous for um nato and the u.s in that respect mm. so there's no upside um at this this position that we're in for uh, a NATO intervention. And you asked also, like, why hasn't NATO been more capable? Part of it is um, a kind of geopolitical version of um, clueless white guy confidence. The uh, United States is so used to being a unipolar hegemon that it doesn't, it's forgotten how to do the work against a uh, near peer competitor. Uh, there are, um, there's also the It's like parasitic. Rocky in Rocky three, right? Or Rocky four. It's just, he's exactly. gotten out of shape. All it, all we need is go out in the woods, run around, have a montage. We're back, baby. Just a little the, bit of Rocky training. You know. Exactly. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta like drag those logs, chop that Yeah, drag wood, logs. Yeah, exactly. Fight a bear. Uh, yeah, in this case, right. maybe a symbolic, uh, Russian bear, but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's also the fact that the American military industrial complex has become quite parasitic. The Department of Defense buys weapon systems like the F-35, which um, are extraordinarily costly, are ridden with uh, major design flaws and bugs, which rendered the first generation of those planes more or less um, inoperable without an extensive refit. 
And the perception or the, the behavior of the American elite makes it clear that these defense contractors, the Department of Defense is there to pump money into the weapons manufacturers, not the weapons manufacturers to equip the military. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most um, effective weapons uh, systems, weapons platforms the United States has is the AC-10 Warthog. Fantastic, uh, un unmatched uh, close air support vehicle, tough as a uh, you know, Soviet biscuit case, right? Like mm -hmm. it, uh, very heavily armored, very, very good at its job. The Air Force keeps trying to mothball it so it can um, create um, operational and budgetary space for more advanced um, fighter platforms, which is insane, right? Like you've got something that works and is cheap and you want to, abandon it for an unproven lemon, an mm -hmm. unproven potential lemon with an astronomical price tag. But the AC-10 is not as profitable as the F-35. So those perverse incentives have also degraded the capacity of the US military. And as you sell this to your allies, because everybody in NATO had to buy an F-35, had to buy a squadron of F-35s, then you're also degrading your allies as well. The Europeans have they actually benefited from a peace dividend, unlike the US, in that their NATO membership has allowed them to reduce their um, defense expenditures, which honestly is great for them. Everybody should do it. But um, this does mean that they have less of a uh, contribution to make for collective defense. And the tempo of political tension and contestation and threat domestically has demoralized the um, professional um, foreign service. It's demoralized elements of the deep state, the uh, war on terror, develop certain capacities, things like um, black ops, things like special forces, things like torture. But that emphasis can't, comes at the cost of conventional war fighting. And the reorientation of big systems that are no longer fit for purpose is itself a major bureaucratic and organizational effort. And no one in Washington wants to do that. It's difficult to reform um, government, uh, federal departments, and people generally don't stick around long enough to have that kind of impact. The continuity of power in Russia, uh, where Putin's been around since the turn of the millennium, Lavrov has been around for a very long time in the foreign ministry, has allowed Russia to complete long-term um, reform plans to do things that are hard. While in the US, Obama was supposed to have solved the Iran nuclear deal, but all of that works gets shredded immediately in the next election. So, you know, uh, there was a moment there where I think the sun went behind a cloud behind you and mm -hmm. you you were you appeared on screen, uh, but um, up until that time, uh, with your vocal with your vo vocal fry and your backlit, it's like you know, anonymous State Department official mm -hmm. gives us a rundown on on the Ukraine situation, and um, uh, I think that at the start I probably put that little this clip right near right here is before the whole thing starts. But before I let you go, we've been talking about about an, an hour, but we should talk about what's going to be what it's going to be like for the people in the Ukraine uh and what it's going to be like in the world after this um how how i mean for day-to-day -day life for everyday people in Ukraine what are they looking at right now it, it they're looking at potentially lethal risk to their safety and the 
disruption of any kind of um, collective um, economic, social um, functions. Mm -hmm. The uh, President Zelensky has declared martial law. So that's the end of um, regular civil liberties. Russia has so far limited its uh, strikes to military infrastructure and has avoided um, fighting in the cities, which is good because that reduces civilian casualties and um, prevents things like power outages causing um, more fatalities or uh, disruptions in uh, the water supply. The if you can get out, you should get out. If you can, um, that might, will prove difficult because there's no air traffic out of uh, Ukraine anymore. It's contested airspace. No one would fly into it. The uh, Moldovans have announced that their border is open and they're not turning anyone away. So if you could go by land into Moldova, that's that would be that that would be a smart move, especially if. Um, I read in pro-Russian sources, not pro-NATO uh, ones, but pro-Russian sources, that there's a list of 5,000 political enemies, people associated with the Azov Battalion, with the Ukrainian far right, with the uh, Zelensky government or prior governments uh, that are to be rounded up, uh, arrested, and potentially tried. Um, if you're one of those 5,000 or if you are a journalist that's been too critical of uh, Russia, then, you know, for your own safety, you should, you should leave as quickly as possible. If you're, um, if you can't leave Ukraine, then get away from the front. There will be fighting, but it will be in these corridors leading to strategic points, um, especially on the main road and rail lines linking the Russian border with uh, Dnipro, with Kharkiv, with Chernigov, with Kiev, Kherson, with Odessa. Move west as quickly as you can. Um, if you can't, then um, fortunately, Soviet metro uh, stations are designed to be bomb shelters. That infrastructure is already there. That's a place of refuge. Um, think about water. Think about food. Think about how you're going to make it through um, the coming days and weeks. Ideally, the hostilities will end relatively quickly. Maybe there will be a negotiated ceasefire. Maybe there'll be a capitulation by the Zelensky government. Maybe there'll be a swift Russian victory. The worst possible thing would be a protracted uh, campaign with urban fighting and an anti-Russian insurgency that um, brings severe repression against civilian populations. I think that this ends with the Russians in Kiev, and there are a few potential ways that they impose um, settlement to their liking. Mm -hmm. One is just replace the Zelensky government with a pro-Russian Ukrainian government, keep the borders the way they are. Mm -hmm. um, that would help avoid some of the um, perception of unilateral imperialism, conquest of territory, mm -hmm. that even some non-NATO countries might sincerely forward as, uh, as reasons for opposing Russia. Mm -hmm. You could also um, slice in the territories you want. Um, and create a rump uh, Ukrainian state in Kiev. Um, or you could try to take it all and absorb it into the Russian Federation, like you did with Crimea. Uh, I think Donetsk and Lugansk, at least, are going to be joined to the Russian Federation. Probably a strip along the Black Sea to connect um, Crimea overland to uh, the rest of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. The big question in terms of the post-war settlement will be what to do about Western Ukraine. Most of Ukraine is 
linguistically mixed, heavily Russophone, um, with a substantial population that is both Russophone and identifies as Russian by ethnicity. Many Ukrainians, people who identify as Ukrainian, um, have connections. Uh, they speak Russian, they have Russian family, they um, recognize the kinship and continuity between Ukraine and Russia. So if Putin can deliver to central Ukraine, the Odessa region, um, eastern Ukraine, the same kind of deal he got Crimea, meaning stability, investment, normal life, right? We put mm -hmm. this, we put the bad times behind us. Then those regions are very likely to um, resign themselves or reconcile themselves with that reality. It's actually not that bad a deal. They're Eastern Europeans. They're pessimistic about life. They take what they can get. Mm -hmm. The issue is Western Ukraine, uh, the areas which were under Polish rule before World War II, where continuity with Ukrainian nationalism is the strongest. And that's where you have right sector. That's where you have um, many of the hardest, most Nazi adjacent um, nationalists, uh, parties and leaders based. And there, the population is overwhelmingly Ukrainian linguistically and by self-identified ethnicity. They do not see a continuity between Russian identity and Ukrainian identity, but instead see them oppositionally. Mm -hmm. And they would be, uh, the likelihood of an insurgency there is extremely high if there's a protracted Russian occupation. Mm -hmm. So if Putin... Um, creates a federated post-Russian uh, Ukraine where the Western regions can sort of run their own affairs and, and grumble in, um, in relative peace. That that would be um, that would be an outcome that might be lead to a more humane, more stable post-war if he hides it off either with Zelensky. Um, running a continuity of government out of Lvov or a new Western Ukrainian state based in Lvov with a new government um, outside of Russian occupation and outside of the Russian sphere of influence, then again, they'd seethe in silence, but they could lean towards the West. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would also be a relatively humane outcome. The, my great fear and what alarms me is mm -hmm. that Russian troops will enter Western Ukraine and they will stay as occupiers. That would be terrible for a couple of reasons. One, um, you would need a high degree of repression in order to maintain Russian authority in mm. Western Ukraine. Um, the human cost would be considerable and it would be a perennial source of, a, you know, a powder keg. And also, it would mean that Russia was willing, because this is not any information that the Kremlin doesn't already understand. Mm -hmm. So if they step in, they're making the choice to deploy repression on a mass scale, to um, endure a violent insurgency against them, to mm -hmm. um, go where they're not wanted in territory that is strategically and economically marginal to them just for the sake of a few hundred miles of strategic depth. And if that's what they're willing to do in a region like Western Ukraine, then the very same logic would apply to the Baltic states, the very same logic would apply to any of Russia's neighbors. We're mm -hmm. willing to essentially enslave and oppress you for the sake of pushing out um, our mm -hmm. front lines a few hundred miles. Mm -hmm. And so that's... That's the biggest risk in the in the post-war, apart from some insane meddling that actually causes NATO and, and Russian forces to um, enter contact and then potentially uh, fight one another on Ukrainian territory. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I have one last question, which is that 
I've noticed that online and the online left, the left is sort of divided uh, between people who are uh, anti-Russian and pro-Russian, basically, people who see the Russian invasion of Ukraine as worthy of um, praise, maybe even, and supporting the anti-imperialism of the Putin regime against the West or quick to blame the West for this. I think we've walked the line of not um, uh, being hyper partisan or, you know, you know, not we're, we're Westerners, but we're not um, unrealistic about the role the United States has played uh, in this conflict. Um, but it seems to me that you're not, you know, advocating that the left fall in line behind Putin and, and the invasion and his invading armies either. Right. No, uh, certainly uh, not. not. Yeah. The, for purely pragmatic reasons, no, um, no, no moral considerations, no moral judgment, no questions of legitimacy. I would prefer that Russia win quickly or Ukraine surrender quickly simply to reduce the human toll in what looks like to be an inevitable, inevitable Russian, uh, right. Victory. But if, if you're a socialist and your primary concern is advocating and, 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 uh, pushing the cause of socialism, it doesn't seem to me that there's a, I mean, what you're talking about, a quick and decisive victory for Putin so that to minimize the, um, the human debt cost might be worth advocating for, but otherwise I don't see an outcome that is no. helping socialism or, or the working class at no. all. No, there's, um, there's no upside to, um, this conflict whatsoever. And Putin is replacing feckless Western imperialism with effective Russian imperialism. It's an open question if there's any difference between the two. The um, and whatever difference there is is entirely again a pragmatic consideration, right? Are the right. lives of the people under these different regimes better or worse? But there's no empowerment of the working class. There's no movement towards a uh, socialist economic mode. All of those considerations are just completely absent. There's there are two nationalist um, capitalist blocks fighting over turf. Nothing more. Right. All right. Thank you, Kuba.